Well, Mar, are you are you there? Here, yeah. Okay, you can share your screen. Let me see if I can still hear you. Uh, hi. How should I? Can you see my slides already? Yes. Good. Okay, so let me present you. So it's my uh, pleasure to introduce Professor Omar Antolin Camarena, uh, who is uh, who I collaborate with sometimes. He's a professor at the Institute of Mathematics at UNAM, and he will uh, um, present his particular point of view on 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 these matters. So. Omar, please go ahead. Thank you, Daniel. Um, my, my particular point of view, Daniel, is that uh, this is probably going to feel a little too mathy to most people. Um, so let me start by discussing that. Oh, before I get to that, I wish I had included the word symorphic in the title. Um, we're going in the complete opposite direction of the previous talk and discussing only symorphic crystallographic groups. Okay, so uh, first I should start by giving you a disclaimer, and uh, it, I guess it's fairly serious as disclaimer go. Uh, problem is I don't really know what I'm talking about. Uh, I'm a mathematician. I will give you a mathematician's point of view, topological phases. Uh, my co-author, Daniel Sheinbaum, is the understands the physics, and uh, he understands it well enough that you wouldn't immediately guess that he is also a mathematician, but that seems to be a handicap of me. Um, He's kindly agreed to help me answer questions. Um, all right, so um, we're going, I'm going to discuss uh, a classification that Daniel and I propose for uh, topological phases of certain systems. And the most attractive feature of this classification is that it is based on very few assumptions. It's based mostly only on an assumption on how we model adiabatic evolution, okay? So that's uh, what I wanted to start with. We will only uh, work with uh, systems that are given by a gapped Hamiltonian. That's already a restriction, um, but this is fairly normal for uh, studying topological phases. And um, so you can think of selecting a certain class of systems that you want to talk about and discuss um, adiabatic evolution within that class of Hamiltonians to um, decide when it's possible to go from one system to another system by gradually changing conditions. And um, so we're going to um, model this adiabatic evolution in a given class of gapped Hamiltonians as follows. Two systems will be said to be in the same phase if there's a continuous one parameter family of gapped Hamiltonians lying in that class um, that goes from H0, which is the Hamiltonian for the first system, to H1, which is the Hamiltonian for the second system. And um, so notice that this assumption says two things. One is that during adiabatic evolution, the Hamiltonians of the systems uh, that you go through vary continuously. And this is not controversial. But we're also saying that any continuous variation of the Hamiltonians, we're going to uh, assume or work in the approximation that any continuous variation of Hamiltonians can be realized as adiabatic evolution. And um, th this second assumption is, is not as widely accepted, and there are alternatives. There's a local unitary evolution used to model adiabatic uh, evolution as well. But we're going to work with this assumption that uh, adiabatic evolution just means that you can vary, you can write a one parameter family of Hamiltonians that goes from one system to the other. And all of the intermediate Hamiltonians in the family are in the same class that you're considering. Uh, they respect the same symmetries, or the other uh, they are they are all gapped, or they're all non-degenerate. Whatever conditions you want to uh, include in your class of Hamiltonians. So this notion of phase is uh, relative to given class of Hamiltonians. Uh, yes, uh, I see that uh, Professor Millard has a question. Mariana, you raise your hand. Uh, yes, um, yeah. I just wanted to ask a very uh, a fundamental question, uh, which is something that I never fully understood 
which is why uh, the closing of the gap violates the assumption of an adiabatic transformation. I mean, physically, we know that the phase transition occurs, the phase transition between two gapped uh, unequivalent states occurs through the closing of the gap. We know that just you know, by looking at physical systems and seeing that this is true. But mathematically, how does that go? Oh, um, I think this is one of these uh, questions I warned I wouldn't really be able to answer. Uh, in, in this model, we, uh, we only considered gap uh, Hamiltonian. So it, the, these adiabatic evolutions, they, they cannot go through gapless systems. Uh, and we can still show that there are pairs of systems where you can't go from one to, a, to the other. And uh, so uh, I'm, I'm afraid I, I don't know this uh, feature you're saying that. It, so there, okay, so there is a notion of phase uh, where there are distinct phases that, that you cannot go from one to another, even though uh, you stay within gap systems all the time. So uh, uh, in a sense, can I say that a gap closing is um, a sufficient marker for a phase transition in, in that in the sense that yes. if the yes. gap closes, there is a phase transition. If the gap uh, doesn't close, there isn't. Uh, I, I, no, I would say it's only sufficient. Uh, I, I'm saying uh, what, what I'm going to talk about here are phase transitions that occur without the gap closing. So if the gap closes, you have a phase transition, but there, there, there might also be distinct phases that, uh, that uh, um, without, without a gap closing. Uh, wait. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I guess this doesn't say whether it happens or not. The gap could close. Uh, right. So take two systems that you cannot connect via gapless uh, paths. It may be the case. Uh, sorry, via uh, gap Hamiltonians, it may be the case that you can connect them uh, through gapless systems, or a priori, I guess it could also be the case that it does not happen. But what I said in answer to your question slightly earlier is, is, is wrong. Here, uh, I'm going. So I'm going to talk about so paths that go only through gapped uh, phases, and I'm not going to say anything about whether you can connect these distinct phases via uh, uh, a path that does go through a gapless Hamiltonian. Um, certainly, uh, there will be some some distinct phases that that you could go that, that could be connected going through a gapless Hamiltonian. And so, going through a gapless Hamiltonian does indicate a phase transition. I'm just not certain that that's the only kind there is. Okay. Okay. Thank you. D Danielle, were you going to add something? Uh no, I think you covered most of it. So. Okay. okay. All right. So, um, uh, well, I wanted to point out that this definition of phases is already topological in a sense. Um, you, so we're saying that the set of phases for a given class of Hamiltonians is the set of path components of the space of Hamiltonians. And that's one way to think about these things mathematically. To pick a class of systems, uh, you, you consider the, the uh, a space whose points are the Hamiltonians, and then you're talking about uh, path components within that space. Okay, uh, so a path component of a space is just the subset that you get by picking one point in the space and seeing which other points you can reach via a continuous path. And um, so Hamiltonians for, well, let's talk about single particle systems first. Um, I'll think of these as operators on a complex Hilbert space. And so when you decide which class of Hamiltonians you want, you're picking out a certain subspace of the space of uh, operators on this complex Hilbert space. And many of these subspaces are known, uh, are studied, and their topology, uh, things about their topology is known. So this is a, a good setting for this um, endeavor. And um, so now let's uh, start introducing symmetry. We'll only talk about crystals, infinite crystals, and um, the marker of an infinite crystal is that you have translation symmetry in every spatial direction, right? And so uh, in terms of the Hamiltonian, what this means is that there is this lattice of translations for the crystal, and we will assume 
that the Hamiltonian commutes with the translation operators for that lattice, the translation operators will just move uh, the argument of a function, right? And that the, Hamil that the Hamiltonian is translation invariant means that it commutes with these operators. And uh, so, for example, a Hamiltonian might look like minus the Laplacian plus a certain potential. And if the potential is periodic, periodic in the directions of the lattice, then that Hamiltonian will be translation invariant. And to deal with these, there's Bloch's theorem that says that there is a basis of wave functions that are eigenstates uh, and are of the form uh, e to the i k dot x for some k times a function which is periodic in the lattice. So uh, Bloch's theorem says that there's a basis of wave functions whose only non-periodicity is controlled by this exponential term um, which depends on a certain value of k. Okay, and that k is, is the um, it, it, uh, that k is the thing we're going to focus on now. Um, so a different perspective on Bloch's theorem is it comes from functional analysis. Um, you can fix the value of k and consider all functions of the form a periodic function times that exponential that uses k. And that's a certain subspace of the Hilbert space where your Hamiltonian is defined. And those uh, small Hilbert spaces, they form what's called a direct integral decomposition of the large Hilbert space. It's, um, think of it as sort of a bundle of Hilbert spaces. The possible values of K form the Brillouin zone, which is a torus. And for each point in that torus, you have a little Hilbert space. And these sort of vary continuously as you move the point in the torus. And um, the entire Hilbert space consists of the, uh, the functions that assign to each point in the torus a vector in the corresponding Hilbert space h sub k in a way that this function is L2. And, um, and so in these terms, so notice that so far I haven't said anything about the Hamilton, right? This is just something that you can do to a Hilbert space uh, to uh, decompose it in parts that correspond to the different translations. But now if you have an operator on the Hilbert space H that commutes with the translation operators, Bloch's theorem in this language says that the operator itself has a direct integral decomposition too. And it's made up of all of these little, little <laughs> Bloch Hamiltonians, each of which acts on one of the Hilbert spaces HK. And um, if the original Hamiltonian is gapped, then uh, these will be gapped as well, or all of them outside of a set of measure zero, which we can ignore. And um, so from this translation symmetry, you get, now you get some interesting topology. Um, Bloch's theorem gave us this torus, which is the Brillouin zone. Uh, it didn't really have anything to do with the Hamiltonian. The torus itself came just from the translation symmetries. And uh, what can we do with the Hamiltonian now in terms of this composition? Um, well, this, this picture of a bundle of Hilbert spaces that varies over the torus um, is, is maybe less interesting than it sounds because Kuiper's theorem says that any bundle like that is trivial. So you don't really have to think of the HK as varying. It will be the same as another bundle where you have the same a Hilbert space H prime over every point of the torus. And uh, so inside that H prime, you can look at the ground state for the block Hamiltonian, and that's a certain subspace. In, for, in the non-degenerate case, that will be a one-dimensional complex vector space, but in general, it would be some m-dimensional subspace where m is the degree of degeneracy. And uh, so what what we have is at every point of the Brillouin zone, we have a m-dimensional subspace of this now fixed Hilbert space H prime. And the collection of these m-dimensional subspaces is something that, that is also widely studied. It's called a Grossmannian space. And, um, and it's denoted by GRM, which indicates the dimension of and then what space they're all a subspace of, in this case, H prime. Okay, so these are the Grossmannians. And so what we're saying is that at every point in the torus, uh, our Hamiltonian picks out by choosing the ground state, 
for the Bohr Hamiltonian at that point, uh, it picks out a point in this space of, of m dimensional subspaces. Okay, so this this uh, Grossmannian is a space whose points are, correspond to m dimensional subspaces of H prime, and we have one at every point. So we have a function that goes from the torus to the Grossmannian, and at every single point, it picks out the ground state. Okay. And um, so now we've sort of summarized uh, the, or rather decomposed, the original Hamiltonian into this map that goes from the torus to the Grossmannian. And uh, we can think about what our model for adiabatic evolution means in terms of, of these maps, right? So remember that we were saying that adiabatic evolution means that you can write down a one parameter family of Hamiltonians that varies continuously. Uh, and for every uh, value of that parameter, the Hamiltonian should still lie in the class that you're interested in. So in this case, we want to assume that they're all still gapped and have at least this translation symmetry. Um, so what does adiabatic evolution mean for these ground state maps? Well, the same thing as before. The ground state map, which is a continuous function from the torus to the Grossmannian, can be thought of as a point in the space of all maps from the uh, torus to the Grossmannian. And uh, so two will be in the same phase if they can be connected by a continuous path in this space. But it's, um, know, it's a little abstract to think about uh, a path in a space of maps. So there's a more down to earth uh, way to think of that. And uh, that is as homotopy, and I'll explain the relation in a bit. So a homotopy is, is a relation that occurs between two continuous maps that go from the same domain space to the same target space, in this case, going from the Roulan zone to the Grossmannian of m dimensional subspaces of the Hilbert space. And a homotopy is a single map with one extra parameter that goes from zero to one. And when that extra parameter is at zero, you should get the first map that you want to connect. And when that parameter is one, you get the second map. So you know it's it's a function of just one more variable, um, but it really represents a path of maps between the torus because for every number between between zero and one, I could consider fixing the second uh, variable at that number. So I could replace this zero with any number between zero and one. And that gives me a function, a function just of, um, I guess I should have called this k. Uh, this is a point in the Brillouin zone, right? So for every value of the parameter in zero one, I get a map from the torus uh, to the Grossmannian. And that, that's a path in the space of maps, right? So this is a, a homotopy. I typically tend to think of them as uh, sort of movies, which I guess in this context could be confusing because time is already taken. But uh, you can pretend that this parameter is time. Uh, I mean, it's not in this case. But normally, I'm working in a situation where there is no time, so I'm free to use time. Uh, so imagine this is time. So then this thing is uh, you have a way to picture a single map from the torus to the Grassmannian, maybe by drawing its graph or a cartoon of its graph because it's complicated. And uh, then you imagine the homotopy as a movie where the graph of the map gradually changes from one to the other, okay? And um, so uh, oh, there's this uh, notation for the set of homotopy classes of maps. And as we said before, this is just the set of path components of the space of maps. Um, and these homotopies, they're a very important concept in algebraic topology, and it, it's only a slight exaggeration to say that algebraic topology is the study of continuous functions taken up to homotopy. Um, they are used to analyze spaces and to assign invariance to spaces, these uh, uh, homotopies, and particularly these sets of homotopy classes of maps. And maybe the most prominent example of that are uh, homotopy groups. The homotopy groups of a space are homotopy classes of maps into the space from a sphere. And I want to mention these not because it's what we're dealing with. We're dealing with maps from a torus, from the Brillouin zone, right? Um, but the sphere is, say, a simpler manifold than the torus. So it might be uh, illustrative to see what happens if you consider homotopy classes of maps from a sphere. And uh, this thick dot here is, for, is there for a technical reason. Uh, technically, we, we don't want arbitrary maps, just maps that send a 
chosen point here to a chosen, chosen point there. You can ignore this. Um, these, these homotopy classes of maps, um, they can be given a group structure. And a group structure means that uh, there's an addition operation defined inside the set. So you can take two maps from the sphere into X and then add them. Um, when n is greater than one, this is just like normal addition in that it's associative and it's commutative, doesn't matter in which order you add things. And there's a corresponding operation of subtraction. And uh, so th these groups are, uh, well, they're, they're, we have very, in, there are very systematic naming conventions for such groups. And uh, so that it, it's a good object to want to calculate because there's an easy way to tell someone what the answer is. And, um, but the main thing you need to know about these homotopy groups is that they are very hard to compute, even for spheres. So I'm already looking at maps that go, that come from a sphere to a space X. I'm saying even if X itself is also a sphere, this set can be very difficult to compute. And uh, let me show you a little table of the first few values. Um, so here, the rows correspond to spheres of different dimensions. And the columns correspond to different degrees of homotopy groups. So for example, um, take a look at this entry. That would be pi 3 of S2. So that means it's homotopy classes of maps from a three-dimensional sphere to a two-dimensional sphere. And you might think that when you're mapping a higher dimensional sphere to a lower dimensional sphere, things are very easy. And um, it, it's not easy to imagine a map that you couldn't deform uh, to, to produce, say, a constant map, right? One, one, one boring kind of map I can always do is take the entire three-dimensional sphere and send it to a single point on the two-dimensional sphere. Um, but the fact that this group here is the integers, that's, that's an infinite set, says that there's infinitely many maps that I cannot deform to this one, nor to each other, right? So there's infinitely many different maps from pi three, from S, from S3 to S2 that cannot be deformed continuously with another. And in some cases, there's only finitely many. For example, if you're mapping from a four-dimensional sphere to a two-dimensional sphere, there's only two different maps of the homotopy. There's the constant map and there's some other map, right? And uh, every single continuous map from a four-dimensional sphere to a two-dimensional sphere can be deformed either to one of those maps or to the other. Yeah. And, um, so the index here uh, tells you the size of these groups. This Z mod 12 means it's, there are 12 elements here. So ignore this addition, just think about the size. There are 12 representatives of maps from a six dimensional sphere to a two dimensional sphere, such that every single map, every single continuous function from six dimensional sphere to a two dimensional sphere can be deformed to one of those 12 representatives. Okay, and uh, so these groups are, uh, I mean, even the form of the answer is pretty messy, um, but, and they're, they're also very hard to compute. Okay, um, so now let me get back uh, to talking about our crystals and uh, let, let's talk about uh, considering, so far we've been talking about single particle systems. Let me say what happens if you consider adding, a, if consider a many particle system with interaction. And uh, so traditionally, this block decomposition and the Brillouin zone are only used for single particle systems. But there's no, there's not really a mathematical reason for this. Um, the uh, what Daniel and I found is that the usual argument showing the block de decomposition is perfectly general, and it also works uh, for many particle systems with interaction. So let me explain that. Um, Hamiltonian for a many particle system, it still is defined on a Hilbert space. Just the, the Hilbert space is the Fox space or the Poissonic Fox space or the fermionic Fox space associated to the Hilbert space for the single particle system. So, so if H1 is the Hilbert space for the single particle system, then uh, the Hilbert space for the uh, uh, many particle system will be something like this, right? It'll be uh, the, uh, the completion of the direct sum of all tensor powers. Or you know you can split into just the bosonic part where you take the symmetric powers, or just the uh, fermionic part where you take the alternating powers, and um, so it's it's still a Hilbert space, it's still uh, separable, and um, and mathematically 
all separable Hilbert spaces are isomorphic to each other. So this direct integral decomposition that didn't use any properties of the Hamiltonian was just came from the symmetries uh, that can be adapted to Fox space. And uh, this was meant to be a little asterisk above adapted. Uh, there's a subtlety which I'll discuss on the next slide. Um, so, but the end result of this is that the, the, the result we described that the homotopy classes of maps from the Berlin zone to Grassmannian describe the, the possible phases for uh, crystalline many particles, uh, for crystalline systems also holds for many particle systems with interaction, okay? And uh, so the subtlety has to do with uh, how you have to treat translations. So consider a typical Hamiltonian for a system with n particles uh, with uh, a potential that's, that has this translation symmetry that's periodic and in every spatial direction. And then maybe you have an interaction term that looks like this um, involving you know, uh, terms proportional to the reciprocal of the square of the distance between different particles. Um, for a system like that, if you translate just one of the particles, if you replace xi with xi plus r, um, you don't get, the Hamiltonian does change, right? These terms, th those terms don't change, right? If you translate only one particle, then, well, n minus one of these terms stay the same, but the nth term corresponding to the particle you translate also stays the same because the Laplacian is invariant under translation, and we're assuming that the uh, potential is periodic. Uh, but these terms will not stay the same if you translate a single particle, right? If you only translate x1, for example, then all of the terms in the sum that have x1 uh, will change. But um, what you can do is add the same vector to all the xi, right? If you translate all particles simultaneously, uh, then this uh, Coulomb interaction term is also invariant, right? And so this is what, this is the notion of translation that you need to extend Bloch's theorem to Fox space. Right? Uh, so when we're talking about this translation action on Fox space, we mean in the direct sum, in every single, uh, you have a direct sum of tensor powers, symmetric powers, or alternating powers, and each factor in that power need, uh, needs to be simultaneously translated. And uh, so with that translation action, you can write a direct integral decomposition of Fox space imitating the usual argument. and for Hamiltonians that commute with these simultaneous translation operators, you also get an integral decomposition, okay? So um, mathematically, it works as basically the same as in the single particle case. It is slightly less useful, it doesn't have all the features maybe, but um, it, it's good enough for our purposes. And um, okay, so, so far I've been talking about the translation symmetry in crystals, uh, but you know, crystals can have larger groups of symmetries, and we can consider systems that that uh, preserve that have that symmetry, and then restrict adiabatic evolution to go only through systems that respect the full symmetry. Okay, and we we'd be interested in seeing what phases a system has if it respects a symmetry. And so, uh, I, I guess uh, I guess this slide sort of shows my mathematical bent. You're and we probably really only care about dimensions two and three, but I just wanted to point out that studying crystallographic groups is really hard in higher dimensions. Uh, this is the number of groups that there are in each dimension up to dimension six, and uh, I, I think it's very noticeable to see the years in which these counts were obtained, right? Uh, dimension two and three we've known since 1891. Dimension five and six are only known since the year 2000. And I'm pretty sure that that is as far as it goes. I don't think anybody knows how many crystallographic groups there are in dimension seven. Um, but as I said, you probably only care about dimension two and three for uh, these purposes. Okay. Um, so I, I also have a slide showing wallpaper groups. Uh, there's, there's also a nice algorithm represented in this picture that helps you decide by looking at a picture which of the symmetry groups it has. And uh, it's, the, you start by asking 
yourself what's the highest order of a rotation symmetry and then branch along these paths. Uh, I won't go into details of it, but uh, this is uh, this is an algorithm that was uh, first described by Brian Sanderson. And this picture is Dora Barnapan's version of it. Um, okay, so uh, we won't be dealing in this work with all possible symmetry groups. In fact, I'll be working only with symorphic ones because for our approach, those are much easier and uh, requires a, a rather difficult adaptation to work in the non-symorphic case that, that I'm about to describe now. So let me just remind you one. So uh, uh, Professor Mallard said in the previous talk that in the case of two-dimensional symmetry, uh, there's an easy way to just say what you mean by symorphic. Symorphic means no glides, right? No glide reflections. Um, in general, in any number of dimensions, you can find a symorphic uh, group by saying that the point group, which is, um, uh, well, one way to think of it is what kind of operations you have if you disregard translation, right? So what, what symmetries of the cell there are, ignoring whether you're sending a cell to the same cell or a different or a translant of it. Um, so those are that's the point group. And that point group should be a subgroup of the group or a symorphic group. Um, OK, so now take a symorphic crystallographic group. And, and if you have a Hamiltonian for a system that is invariant under all of those symmetries, uh, then using, uh, so th then we can form, you know, the point group will act on several things. The point group will act on the Coulomb zone. This actually has nothing to do with the Hamiltonian as before. Um, but it also acts on the Hilbert space in the block decomposition. And there is an action on the Grassmannian. And then here is where the Hamiltonian reappears. This ground state map sends each point in the Brillouin zone to the ground state of its block Hamiltonian. That will be equivariant with respect to the point group, meaning that uh, you can act with a point group symmetry on the point in the Brillouin zone and then take its ground state, or you can uh, first find the ground state for that point on the torus and then apply the symmetry of the Grassmannian to it, and you get the same answer. Okay. And uh, so this is, uh, this is the heart of our classification for uh, these interacting topological faces uh, for crystallographic groups. This is sort of a theoretical result, and I'll, I'll talk about the calculations in a bit. But uh, so this is something that Danielle and I uh, worked out last year or so. It was, uh, sorry, two years ago. It was uh, published in the Journal of High Energy Physics in, in 2021. And uh, so let me just restate what I've said so far. The result says that if you have a symorphic crystallographic group whose point group is P, and you consider gapped interacting systems with symmetry group G, then the, uh, the, the set of topological phases for those systems is given by the set of equivariant homotopy classes of maps from the Brillouin zone to the Grassmannian of m-dimensional subspaces of a several, a severable Hilbert space, where this number m is the degeneracy of the ground state uh, in your systems. Okay. And uh, so what does this tell us? Well, it gives some mathematical description of the full set of possible topological phases. It's maybe a slightly awkward description. You'd want calculations of this in concrete cases. And uh, to be honest, in general, there is not that much that we've been able to do with the set yet. But in the non-degenerate case, when m equals 1, uh, we can go further. And to explain that, I uh, need to talk to you about cohomology. That's the invariant that we have here. And it's also the invariant in the title of this talk. Um, so let me first um, tell you about cohomology in the non-equivariant context in a situation you might be more familiar with. Uh, so I'm going to talk about cohomology. And maybe the most familiar kind of cohomology is what's called Duran cohomology, uh, which is done with differential forms. And uh, so, you know, the basic phenomenon is that 
if you have a closed manifold and you want to integrate a differential form on it, um, you know, sometimes you're forced to get zero and sometimes you're not forced to get zero. And whether you are or are not depends on the topology of the manifold, okay? Um, so the most basic example of this is the line integral in the complex plane around uh, the unit circle around the origin. If you take a form like dz over z, note that this form cannot be extended to cover the origin in the complex plane. Um, the, the integral is 2 pi i. This is a very familiar phenomenon. And uh, so, so this integral not being 0 reveals this hole that where you cannot extend the differential form to. And so one way to formalize this is with the Durand cohomology. Uh, so what you do is to define Durand cohomology for some manifold x, you look, it, it's, it's, it gives you um, a group in every dimension d, in every dimension up to the dimension of x. This, this formula works afterwards, but just gives you zero. Um, so for every dimension below the dimension of manifold x, you look at d forms whose exterior derivative is zero, and inside that set of d forms, there are the forms that are the exterior derivative of some other form alpha, right? And so these are two um, vector spaces. This one, the, the, the set of d alphas sits inside the set of closed forms omega. And uh, so you can take the quotient vector space, or you know, take, for example, the orthogonal complement, if you think of this one as lying inside the other one. And uh, that is the Durand cohomology group. And so it knows about this whole in, uh, so th this form is defined in the entire plane except the origin. That origin is a hole in the plane where this form just cannot be extended to. And Durand cohomology knows about that form. Uh, this example here shows, uh, well, basically, uh, it's related to the fact that if you compute one dimensional Durand cohomology of the complex numbers minus the origin, you get R. But if you compute cohomology of the complex numbers without the right, the entire complex plane, you get zero, right? So this is um, the basics of uh, cohomology differential forms. But there is a completely different way to think about cohomology. And uh, so there are some very special spaces which are weird. They're not geometrical. They're infinite dimensional. Um, they're, they're designed to have simple homotopy groups, but they're typically not simple in any other way, just in, in the sense that the homotopy groups are easy. And uh, these are called eilenberg maclane spaces. There is one for every integer uh, positive, every positive integer n and every abelian group. And uh, so this space kan has the property that its homotopy groups are almost all zero. The only one that isn't is the one in degree n, that one would be a. And these uh, unusual spaces allow you to give a completely different view of cohomology. Uh, you can define cohomology of a space x with coefficients in some group in dimension. Sorry, I have a d here and an n there. Those two were meant to be the same letter. Um, so d dimensional cohomology should use kad. That's a typo. Um, so you can take homotopy classes of maps from X to one of these island burden plane spaces, and those that set of homotopy classes of maps is the cohomology. And this is really another view on the same kind of object. If you think of Durand cohomology, it is this new kind of cohomology I just defined, where you take the group A to be the real numbers. Okay, so Durand cohomology is a special case of this new kind of cohomology. But here, you don't have to use the real numbers. You can use any group you want. And uh, typically, algebraic topologists are more interested in using the integers um, because this, this, this cohomology group is more subtle. It can have, uh, it can have torsion. It can have elements of finite order. And uh, you know, it could even be finite itself. It, uh, the ones for R are all these real vector spaces. And so they are just described by their dimension. It's just maybe more interesting to look at these. And the cohomology uh, with the integers here uh, determines the cohomology with any other kind of uh, coefficients by a somewhat indirect procedure. It's called the universal coefficient, uh, which we will not make.
Um, now, so the reason I'm telling you about this uh, view of, uh, of cohomology as homotopy classes maps into these uh, ungeometrical spaces is because of a coincidence, I guess you could say. The space KZ2, which would be a space, all of whose homotopy groups are zero except the second one, which is Z, um, that happens to be this very Grassmannian of one dimensional complex subspaces of a complex Hilbert space. Um, this is how it ties in to our classification of topological phases. In the non degenerate case, uh, we will be able to make use of this to turn our description into homology. So, first, recall that we've said that the, the phases of gapped interacting crystalline d dimensional systems, that were, we only respect the translation symmetry, those were given by homotopy classes of maps from the Berlin zone into this Grassmannian of M dimensional subspaces of uh, Hilbert space, where M is the degeneracy. So in the non-degenerate case, when M is one, this Grassmannian, as I just said uh, on the previous slide, is a KZ2. So this turns into cohomology. So these homotopy classes of maps are just H2 of the torus. And H2 of the torus is something that you uh, calculate without too much difficulty. It's a group whose rank is d choose two, d times d minus one over two. And it, it's uh, so, you know, this says that to describe uh, one of these topological phases that only respects the translation symmetry, all you have to do is give the give d2 choose, d choose two invariants, each of which is an integer. Um, but the case of a larger symmetry group is more interesting. If you have and, and again, in our approach, we can only handle some morphic crystallographic groups. Uh, if you have some morphic crystallographic group with a point group P, the phases, um, the, basically the same argument said that you only need to consider variant maps. And you can show that in this case, equivariant maps also just translates to this notion of equivariant cohomology. Um, I won't tell you what that is, uh, but what I will tell you about it is that it's good news that uh, that uh, it, it's good news that we get cohomology groups because algebraic topologists have a, a large toolbox with which to compute cohomology groups. We have many more tools for cohomology groups than we have for just arbitrary homotopy classes of maps. So it's always good when a set of homotopy classes of maps turns to be out some turns out to be some cohomology. Uh, so our cohomology group that classifies uh, these phases, uh, it, we, it turns out that you can show that this is always group cohomology, but not for the original uh, symmetry group, but what uh, Daniel and I have taken to call the reciprocal group, which is the group that has the same point group, but translations from the reciprocal lattice. And uh, this is sometimes isomorphic to the group G you start with, and sometimes um, it's some other crystallographic. It's always a crystallographic group, but it may be a different one from G. Okay. And uh, so now let me compare this with uh, some existing classifications that you can find in the literature. Here, uh, I'm taking this, uh, I'll, I'll give you a reference for this paper of Thorngren and analysis on the next slide. Um, they have a classification of symmetry protected topological phases uh, for. Uh, crystallographic groups, right, for uh, phases or systems that have symmetry given by a crystallographic group. And um, so their answer is fairly different from ours. Here's a, a comparison in the non degenerate case, which is where we can actually compute what ours gives us, um, and in dimension two. So we said that we got this second equivariant cohomology group of the torus. Uh, what they get is the fourth cohomology group of symmetry. Notice that I said that what we get is uh, the second cohomology group, not of the symmetry group, but of its of the reciprocal, group, the one that has the same point group, but translations from the reciprocal lattice. So we also got group cohomology, but we got a different cohomology. And particularly, the dimension enters in a very different way. The re the reason we have H2, I'll remind you, is because of this coincidence that uh, the Grassmannian of one-dimensional subspaces of Hilbert space is a KZ2, 
The reason they have four is that in general, for d dimensions, what they get is d plus two here. So when d is two, you get two plus two, which is four. So the degree in which they have four more g increases with the dimension. Ours does not. It doesn't matter what d is. We're always getting the second uh, homology. So it's it's a pretty different answer. And uh, sometimes we get more phases. Sometimes we get the num same number of phases. Sometimes we get fewer phases. And um, neither. So but, so why are the results of or why are the results different? Uh, here's the promised reference to the paper where I was taking that table from. Um, there are several possible reasons that these classifications are different, and we don't actually know which of these reasons are more important. Um, so the classification of symmetry protected topological phases from that paper of Florengren and Nels, it differs from ours in various assumptions. Uh, so it's for systems with short range entanglement. And remember that this means not only do the systems have to have short range entanglement, but two are in the same phase if you can evolve from one to the other, only going through systems with short range entanglement. So it changes uh, which paths, which adiabatic evolution is allowed. And uh, so they also use stability under the stacking operation. Um, so, so their classification sort of declares that stacking with a trivial phase does not change the phase you are in. And um, so they're really doing counts of relativistic topological field theories. And um, so, you know, it's different assumptions, so you expect different results. The classification I'm explaining here, having fewer faces uh, via the following mechanism. So two states that are in distinct SPT phases, by the virtue of being distinct, they cannot be connected through a path of, of systems, uh, of, sorry, of states that all have, exhibit only short range entanglement. That's why they're in distinct SPT phases. But um, if you don't constrain the adiabatic evolution to only go through short rate entanglement states, they might be able to be connected by a path now, and then they would merge into a single phase in our classification. So that's why we sometimes get fewer, right? Or this could be why we sometimes get fewer. Um, there's also the stacking assumption. Uh, our classification might include fragile phases. These fragile phases are phases which they might become trivial after stacking with a trivial phase, but Without the stacking, they cannot adiabatically evolve trivial phase. And so we might have some of those it might exist. And uh, so those would be considered trivial in the SPT classification, the form grin and else, but not in ours. And if the difference is because there's a genuine difference between these relativistic topological field theories and the gapped uh, top phases of gapped uh, Hamiltonians that we're discussing. Then that difference could go in either direction. It, it could make more phases with fewer phases, or in some groups more and in other groups fewer. All bets are off in that case. Um, all right. So so far I've been discussing all the systems that have a given symmetry group. But what if you have a specific system and you want to know which of these topological phases in our classification it falls into? And uh, that's where we have to disappoint you. The, the, that kind of question is hard with our approach. If you have an explicit formula for a Hamiltonian and you want to figure out which phase it's in, our approach is not of much help. It, it's really basically no help at all. But uh, so we're working on, on figuring out how to do this, how to answer this type of question. Um, even the more, even the seemingly simpler question, if you have two Hamiltonians, uh, forget about like pinpointing which phase they are. Just tell me if they're in the same phase or different phases. Even that is difficult in this approach. It's, it's, it's sort of a global approach. It tells you about all phases without telling you about individual phases. We can't, another issue is that we cannot easily find just examples of things in each phase with this approach. And um, so uh, Daniel likes to compare the situation to the fundamental theorem of algebra. The, the fundamental theorem of algebra tells you that a degree n polynomial has n roots. So 
in a question, in a sense, it answers in completely the question of counting roots of the polynomial. But if you actually want to find the roots explicitly, the fundamental theorem of algebra doesn't help you at all, right? So it, it's a similar situation. All right, um, so that is everything I wanted to uh, tell you about today. Made up for some of the time, I guess. Uh, thank you, everyone. And uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Although, as you, you've seen now, what's more likely to happen is that I will fail to answer any questions and Daniel will have to help. All right, thanks. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor Antolin. And uh, are there any questions? Not see. Uh, okay, uh, uh, Professor Jose Eduardo has a question. Yes, really nice talk. Yeah, very mathematics. Yeah, a lot of very mathematics. Much. But uh, I have a question about the this fragile uh, topological uh, phases. If you can distinguish in your classification, you can say, well, this. This part of the classification, this index corresponds to fragile phases or, or no? No, we can't. We have no idea in our classification what the stacking operation does. Uh, so I don't think we have any realistic hope of identifying, oh, these classes, these are the fragile ones, because we just don't know how to interpret the stacking operation. And in particular, the stacking, this is something I should have mentioned. Uh, so our classification produces groups and groups come with an addition operation. That addition operation is not stacking. And as far as we can tell, the addition operation is from the physical point of view is sort of just a coincidence. It's, it's, it, we're glad it's there because the mathematical tools we need to use the addition operation, but it seems to have no physical interpretation. Okay. Well, and thanks. so in particular, it's not stacking, and we don't know what stacking does in the classification, so we couldn't tell you which phases are fragile. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, Jako Nisinen has a question. Uh, yeah, so I was wondering about quasi-crystalline phases. So you can embed a quasi-crystal to higher D, and then it yeah. becomes a crystal. So, and I think there was also a paper recently by Dominic Elson, collaborator. Uh -huh. So yeah. have you wondered about who's classifying quasi-crystalline topological phases? So right. of course you have to go to higher D and everything comes much, much more complicated. So, but in principle, in this kind of general approach, you could try mm -hmm. to do. Yeah, um, so I don't, well, I haven't thought about it a lot. I'll ask Daniel if he has, but uh, so I, I do know that it is possible to try to approach the, the quasi-crystal problem without going to higher dimensions by changing the mathematical tools that you use. The problem is that instead of spaces, you start dealing with C-star algebras and uh, it, uh, the, the thing, things get complicated in that sense. Um, what you mentioned of embedding it in a higher dimension where it is a crystal, that sounds promising. I guess you'd have to figure out how to, uh, in that higher dimension, cut down to, I mean, you, you don't want to treat the crystal there. You want to cut down to just systems that actually came from the quasi-crystal via this embedding. I'm not sure how you would do that. Um, yeah, so I, 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 I don't know. I haven't thought about it. Uh, Daniel, do, do you know any, do you, um, anything you can add? Mm. No, well, I, I seen the paper by by uh, Van Els and, and collaborators, and uh, I, I think it's very interesting. But precisely the the issue was what you mentioned about uh, C star algebra. So, so is this idea uh, about embedding in higher dimensions allows you to to, to avoid them yeah. to avoid them and use spaces because we're we're not. I mean, or we could get more familiar with the tools computing things like cohomology for C star algebras. We could also do that, <laughs> but it's not something we've we we know very well but yeah. uh but but yeah it sounds uh very interesting thank you for for pointing out this idea are there any more questions i i have a, a comment about what you answered to 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 uh professor jose eduardo 
so, so I think since we can, so since since some of our um, faces can be can come from non-interacting systems, which you can add interactions, and then it turns out that these faces are robust, right? So, so there there's a recent paper that says that fragile, so fragile faces are, you know, the name is a bit of a misnomer because they can be stable to adding interactions according to right. to to and then there's a paper with examples um so the fra the fragility is relative to stacking yes <laughs> to adding bands and so i think that at least we can conclude if we have more so for example we could we could see uh so one could see how many fragile faces you have in the non-interacting case and it's sort of uh coincides with the with the with what we get when we compute our results then we could at least make a comparison and say ah probably probably uh, these phases are are fragile but uh, so maybe not at the individual level but at least we can make our a comparison with the rank of the groups and say something like if the right. rank of if say the how rank many of there the group, are yeah if the rank of the groups is the same in in the non interacting case then you can you can say, oh, okay, so all our faces come from from fragile faces. Yeah. Okay. Are there any more questions? No. Okay. Then let's thank Professor Antolin again, and see you thank all you. at at eleven. Well, sorry, it depends on on your time at at uh, one p.m. Uh, in 50 minutes. In 50 minutes. Thank you. Okay. All right.